We are at the intersection of life and death. Here, we are confronted with the most profound questions of all. Does the waning of this life mark a final passage? Or is this the moment of transition to another state of being? floats in an unimaginable abyss of darkness, a blue planet in the vastness of black space. Touched with a mystic spark of life in some ancient cosmic event, the Earth provided a nurturing cradle for life itself. From the dawn of human history, we have pondered the mysteries of existence and have called upon the awesome places of Earth for answers. In the shadow of these great monuments, our sense of the sacred was born. They inspired us, but questions still remained. In the end, we were driven to emulate the potent majesty of nature for ourselves. Five thousand years ago, our forebears labored to adorn the desert plateau of Giza with great pyramids. In Mesopotamia, spectacular ziggurats were built. In the New World, vast temples would transfigure the jungle. Deserts were etched with strange symbols and designs. And in Europe, the silent monoliths of Stonehenge were erected. The standing stones of Karnak raised. To these monuments, built in different epochs and separated by thousands of miles, share a common purpose? Journalist and author Graham Hancock believes they do. He's traveled to a quiet corner of the northeastern United States, looking for evidence of an ancient science that once provided the motive and the meaning for the monuments our forebears left behind. I think that what we're looking at is architecture connected to a science of immortality. The fundamental obsession of the ancient world was not with this life, but with life after death. Seeking a pattern forged in stone, a pattern repeated over and over again across the globe, Hancock has explored many of the sacred sites of the ancient world. All around the world, we have sites made of enormous blocks of stone and incorporating precise alignments. You can go to Stonehenge and find precisely the same alignment with the winter solstice sunrise there, Karnak, Avebury, in Europe. These are all part of a system, a system designed to facilitate the passage of the soul from life into death. Evidence for this ancient science may exist where it's least expected, even on the borders of New Hampshire and Vermont. The entrance to this ancient stone structure, like Karnak and Stonehenge, is oriented to the path taken by the sun at the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year. According to Hancock, this structure is one more link in the chain of knowledge that reaches back into the depths of time. We don't know who built them. We really don't understand how they were built. 
they don't tell us anything about themselves, we're left to wonder why they were built. Hancock believes the science the ancients incorporated into their monuments has been lost, perhaps beyond recovery. But here, in the bygone world of the Celts and Druids, we can still find witnesses to that earlier tradition. They absolutely knew that life was a preparation for death, for the great adventure that lies beyond death, and that there were things, specific things, that had to be done in this life in order to be ready for the life beyond. Rivers, springs, and lakes were all sacred to the Druids. These places were like doorways between the living and the dead. And at these points of passage, they offered gold jewelry, valuable weaponry, and silver chalices to their gods. Nothing was so precious that it could not be sacrificed. In 1984, a window into this vanished world would open. A severed human foot was discovered on the conveyor belt of a peat processing company near the English town of Lindau Moss. It was the first in a series of clues that would lead to an even more startling discovery. Deep within the ancient marshland, the mummified body of a man had lain hidden for 2,000 years. The body became known as the Lindau Man. It was 12 years ago when I first came to Lindo Moss, the day after a well-preserved human foot had been found at the depot of the Peak Company who worked this site, just a few hundred yards from where we are now. As the local archaeologist, I've been invited to come out and explore the site the following day. And I walked out to almost where we're standing now, and to my amazement, poking out from near the base of one of these sections was a flap of skin, well-preserved human skin the body we now know as Lindau Man. The Lindau Man was uncannily well preserved. His skin was smooth and supple. Even his eyelashes could still be seen. He had neatly trimmed hair, a neatly trimmed beard, so he obviously took care of his appearance. His fingernails, which we found, were wonderfully smooth. Even under the microscope they looked smooth. 